Well, friends, we're continuing in our journey through the book of Revelation in a series I've entitled simply Jesus Wins. And we're in chapter 5, so if you want to Google that or look it up in your Bible, it'll be helpful to both of us, actually, if you have that chapter open in front of you. But before we go to the book of Revelation, I want to talk for a minute about some other books. More and more people are writing books claiming to have seen heaven, or hell for that matter, during their near-death experiences. These books have become so popular that there's now a whole new category in Christian publishing called Afterlife Travel Journals. <laughs> I'm not joking. And, and these books are selling like hotcakes and are being made into blockbuster movies that are making millions of dollars. Don Piper, not to be uh, confused with John Piper, but Don Piper says he spent 90 minutes in heaven and he's written a New York Times bestseller describing his experience. The movie made $2 million on its opening night. Bill Visa or Visa ended up spending 30, 23 minutes in hell instead of heaven, which was a bit unfortunate, but at least he made a few million dollars from his New York Times bestseller which no doubt made his rather nasty experience a bit more bearable. The Boy Who Came Back from Heaven is another New York Times bestseller. It tells the story of a guy called Kevin Malarkey, who also went to heaven. Unfortunately, Tyndale publishers, who should really have known better, had to eventually pull the book off the shelves after Kevin wrote an open letter saying he had lied about everything in the book. I did not die. I did not go to heaven. I said I went to heaven because I thought it would get me attention, wrote Malarkey. Colton Burpo says that he went to heaven as a four-year-old, and his pastor father, who should also have known better, called Todd, wrote another New York Times bestseller, Heaven is for Real, to tell his son's journey. As of September 2021, the movie had made $101 million. We don't have time to speak about the other best-selling so-called Christian books telling so-called true stories of people who have made millions telling us what heaven is like. I'm not saying that all these people are deceivers and liars. Some of them might genuinely believe that they've been to heaven or hell for that matter. It's just that you and I are under no obligation to believe all the new agey sub-Christian nonsense that they write in their books. One of those books I mentioned was by Colin Burpo, uh, sorry, Colton Burpo. Now, he might well believe that God the Father has enormous wings, blue eyes, and yellow hair. That God the Son is wingless, with sea green, bluish eyes, and brown hair, and has a rainbow colored horse. And that the Holy Spirit, well, he's just bluish. You see, you and I don't have to believe something just because Colton says so. And because 12 million people buy his book. Honestly, it's a miracle that unbelievers tolerate us Christians as graciously as they do when we come up with all this nonsense and make millions of dollars from gullible consumers. My point in telling you about these books is that I want you to appreciate what a privilege it is to have Jesus' closest friend, the Apostle John, as our authoritative, God-approved guide as he gives us a trustworthy tour of heaven uh, in these chapters of the book of Revelation. Chapters 4 that we looked at last week and 5 today are something like twins. In chapter 4, John sees a staggering vision of heaven and God's throne room in heaven. It's absolutely breathtaking. The room is lit with blazing light. There's thunder, there's lightning, there's terrifying creatures. You really need to go back and listen to that sermon or at least read the chapter or maybe better still read the chapter if you weren't here last week because that really does give us the setting for chapter 5. Because in chapter 5 now we are going to zoom right in on that throne that is the focal point of the whole of heaven. So let's listen now to what the Apostle John saw and heard next uh, in chapter 5 of Revelation. Thanks David. The lesson this morning is, that I will read is Revelation 5, verses 1 to 10. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides 
and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the, law, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The Lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open the seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on earth. This is the word of the Lord. We continue from verse 11. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshiped. Thank you, readers. Well, what a scene. You know, we really are getting into deeper water now, aren't we, as we progress in the book of Revelation. Like I said, the broad setting is given to us in chapter 4, and we had an in-depth look at that chapter in our Bible studies during the week. And now in chapter 5, we we're taken right up to the throne that dominates the whole of heaven. John looks more closely at the throne, and to his astonishment, standing at the center of the throne is a lamb that looks like it has been slain. It's had its throat cut. Its wool is matted with dry blood, but it's not dead. It's very much alive. And as John watches, every living creature joins in with the hundreds of millions of angels as they worship the Lamb. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's unpack the chapter slowly and see what's going on here. I've entitled our sermon this morning simply a scroll, a Lamb, and a new song. And the first thing that we notice is a scroll that cannot be opened. Verse, verse uh, 1 of chapter 5, Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. Well, hopefully by now we've, we're getting used to John's style of writing and we've understood that we're not meant to understand the details of the book of Revelation literally. For instance, God the Father doesn't literally have a right hand that we read about here. 
And we know this isn't a literal scroll either because it has writing, we're told, on both sides. Scrolls were only ever written on one side. So hopefully by now we're starting to ask ourselves what the scroll might symbolize, what the scroll might represent. We also read that it was sealed with seven seals. The only scrolls that were sealed with seven seals in Roman times were Roman wills. In those days you would write your will and it would be witnessed and sealed by seven witnesses if you were a fairly important person. On your death, a reliable executor would be appointed and he would unseal your scroll and execute your will. He would put your will into operation. He would make sure that your wishes were carried out. Well, here in Revelation 5, we don't have the will of a dead person. We've got the living will of a living God. But it's not a list of predictions about the future, as many have taught over the years. The scroll outlines God's plan to build a kingdom for himself in the last days of human history. The days between Jesus' ascension and his second coming. Verse 2, I saw a mighty angel approach, uh, proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. When the angel asks, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? He's asking, who is worthy of being the executor of God's will? Who is qualified to execute God's plans? Who can God trust with his plan to build his kingdom? God's plan for the world is not a secret. It's there for all to read from the earliest pages of the Bible. His plan is to eradicate sin from his universe and save a people for himself. And we actually see this plan being carried out many times on a small scale uh, in the nation of Israel, where God uses people like Noah or Moses to rescue for himself a people from judgment. So God's plan is not a secret. But the question the angels and John are asking is how on earth is God going to do this on an international, even cosmic scale? Who can God trust with such an ambitious plan? Who is up for the task? Many have tried and failed. Noah, Moses, Joshua, Saul, David, Solomon, Josiah, Hezekiah. Many had tried, but all had failed. And they had not only failed, they themselves had actually made matters worse through their own sin. So the angel bellows, who is worthy? But then there is a deafening silence because there is no one who is worthy. Look at verse 4. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. John weeps because it seems that salvation for human beings isn't going to be an option. It looks like we're going to have to die as God's enemies and get what we deserve. Although God wants to be merciful and forgive sinners like us, it looks like that isn't going to happen because no one good enough can be found. It looks like God's plans to reverse the curse and fix the world are going to come to nothing because there is no one qualified. We are all part of the problem. And so God can't use us. That would be like using wolves to guard the sheep. So of course John weeps. He realizes that Satan has won, that the human race is doomed. Our lives are going to continue to forever be marked by emptiness and injustice and suffering. And the world is going to continue on its headlong quest for self-destruction. All that is left is the fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume those who have broken God's law. We are all destined to die without mercy says Hebrews chapter 10 rather bluntly. God has a plan to fix the world, but there is no one who can put that plan into practice. There is no one who can break open the seals and execute God's salvation plan that is written on the scroll. And so John weeps, as we all should. But then there's verse 5. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. 
This is imagery straight out of the Old Testament. You see, God had promised to send a Messiah, someone worthy of breaking the seals and bringing God's solution to the world. And God said that this Messiah or this Christ or this promised king, all the same word, that he would come from the tribe of Judah and from the line of David. And this Messiah is likened here to a lion. And he would need to be a lion, wouldn't he? After all, he's going to have to take on and conquer sin and death and Satan himself. I reckon a lion is exactly what God needs. A mighty, fearless, terrifying warrior king who can defeat God's enemies and rescue us from the power of sin and death. The angel says, don't despair. Behold the lion that is going to save the world. And John breathes a sigh of relief. He wipes the tears from his eyes and he turns around to see this lion. But to his astonishment, all he sees is the lamb that has been slain. Verse 6, I looked, then I saw the lamb looking as though it had been slain. Standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the world. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. John turns around and looks for a lion that will tear Satan to shreds. But all he sees is a lamb that's had its throat cut with its wool matted with dried blood. What a juxtaposition of amazing power and astonishing weakness all wrapped up in one. A slain lamb who is an all-conquering lion. I say this every week because I need to. We must remember that John is painting us a highly stylized picture, not a photorealistic image. And this stylized picture, or these pictures that he paints for us, they need to be interpreted. They are not to be understood literally. All the elements are symbolic. So the seven horns and the seven eyes, what do they represent? Well, throughout the Bible, horns represent strength, and seven horns represents absolute strength. Omnipotence, actually. An irresistible, absolute, unrivaled power. Omnipotent is this lamb. And the seven eyes, they represent omniscience and omnipresence. Someone who is all-knowing and all-seeing and ever-present. Someone who is alert and aware of every little thing that happens in his universe. Omnipotence, omniscience, and omnipresence. Of course, these are all the attributes of God. John is simply saying that this lamb who is slain is none other than God himself. That's why the lamb isn't just near the throne. It isn't just standing among the 24 elders and the four living creatures that we bumped into last week. No, the lamb, we're told, is standing in the center of the throne, encircled by all the other creatures. In other words, everything revolves around it, or rather him just as everything revolved around God the Father in chapter 4. The Lamb is, of course, Jesus, who is, of course, God. You see, you can't separate Jesus from God himself. Jesus is the God who reigns over the universe. He's not just around the throne worshiping God. He's on the throne accepting the worship that comes his way from the 24 elders and the four living creatures. And we see the same thing over and over again in Jesus' life when he was physically on earth. Jesus always spoke with the authority of God. He never asks God to fix a problem or heal a person or, or raise the dead or drive out a demon. No, Jesus just does those things all by himself. Always by simply speaking a word. Be still and the storm goes flat. Come out of him and out comes the demon. Jesus' Jewish enemies knew exactly what Jesus was claiming. They knew what he was up to. In John 10, they say they're trying to kill him because he claimed to be God. Their words, not mine. And he happily accepted the worship and the honor that people like Thomas gave him while he was on the earth. And here we see him doing exactly the same thing while he's in heaven. Happily accepting worship. 
Who does he think he is? Well, the truth is he thinks he's God. And here we see that he's right. He is God. He is the lion who is the lamb, who has the seven horns and the seven eyes. I wonder who you think Jesus is. A good man? A good teacher? A good example? Well, if Jesus isn't who he said he was, if he isn't God, well, then he was deluded at best and a liar at worst because he constantly claimed to be God. You see, if Jesus isn't God, we shouldn't even admire him. But if he is God, we should worship him. There is no middle ground when it comes to Jesus. He is the mighty lion of Judah who can execute God's plans and bring an end to all the misery that plagues the world. But those plans involve a perfect, spotless, unblemished lamb being slaughtered for the sins of the world. And so Jesus became that too. As Jesus hung as both the perfect human being and almighty God on the cross, God was taking on himself the punishment his own law demands for our sins. He was taking his own punishment on himself. He got what we deserved so that we don't have to. It's what we've just remembered in the communion service. Jesus' death wasn't an embarrassing defeat. It was a stunning victory. It's the fulfillment of God's plan to save an unworthy people for himself. And it's the only means by which God can mercifully and righteously adopt rebellious people into his family so that they can become his sons and daughters, heirs of salvation and heirs of eternal life. Well, what should our response be to such an act of selfless love and sacrifice? Well, we see the answer in the response of the elders in the passage, the people of God who surround the lamb on his throne. And so thirdly, the song of the elders. Verse 8, when he, that is the lamb who is Jesus Christ, had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. We're told to have harps to offer music and bowls to hold our prayers. And the elders who represent all God's forgiven people sing, we're told, a new song. And it's a new song because it's a song that had never been sung before. And that's because it's a, a song that couldn't have been sung before. It couldn't be sung until now. Until the person who could execute God's plans and save sinners had been found. And that's what their song is all about. Look at verses 9 and 10. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood you purchase for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. It's actually a very offensive song when you think about it. It's saying that none of us are good people when you think about it. No one from any tribe, language, people or nation is good enough, we're told, to get to heaven by themselves. We have to be purchased. We have to be made into a kingdom. We're not automatically part of the kingdom of God, nor can we do anything to change our situation. The only way we can become part of the people of God is by Jesus, we're told, paying the price. And what a price he paid. With your blood you purchased for God people from every tribe and language and nation. Basically, the song is saying that we all need charity. And that's very humbling to have to accept. We have to admit that we need help and that we needed Jesus to die in our place. Instead of getting in a huff about that or burying your head in the sand and living in denial, why not rather join the throng in heaven uh, thanking God for his love for us shown on the cross? It reminds me of something the Apostle John said in one of his letters. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. You see, God's standards for getting into heaven are so high that even the faintest blemish will disqualify us. Holy, holy, holy is God we saw last week. Three times perfect. And so we need to be holy, holy, holy to just fit in. And our trouble 
is those seven eyes. The seven eyes of the Lamb that see everything we've said, thought, and done. And yet Jesus was still willing to die for us, to purchase us for himself. Friends, you, would never, you will never regret accepting God's charity and starting to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Because look in verse 10, what he has in store for you. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God. And they will reign on the earth. If you accept God's charity, you will become a subject in the greatest kingdom this world has ever seen, serving the greatest king this world has ever seen. But more than just being a subject or a servant, you, you will also be, we're told, priests representing that king. And more than that, you yourself will reign with him over his kingdom. I guess that makes God's people royalty. Remember last week, we saw that God's forgiven people were all given crowns to wear. You know, Camilla and Megan might well have married into royalty. But John is saying you can become royalty through adoption, through charity, by being adopted by God into his family. God is going to bestow glory and honor on his people and give them authority to rule and reign over the earth. And all because the lion was prepared to become a lamb who was prepared to be slain in your place as your substitute. Well, fourthly, we come to the worship of the angels. The singing of the elders seems to start a chain reaction in heaven. Then I looked, says John, and I heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and in a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. You might have experienced a rugby match or a soccer match with, I don't know, 40, 50, 60,000 people all singing the national anthem together. Well, friends, here are all the angels of heaven. A hundred million, says John, all singing heaven's national anthem. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And Jesus is worthy because he is the lamb who was slain. He has earned every bit of praise he is being given. He is worthy of power. That speaks of political power. That speaks of rule. He is worthy of wealth. In other words, all material treasure. He is worthy of wisdom and strength. He deserves to control our lives and our destinies. We are safe in his hands because here is a God we can trust with our lives. I wonder if that's how you think of Jesus. Is he still only a good man? Only a good teacher? Only a good example? Or is he a king worthy of your worship and your adoration because he was slain for you? And so God's people praise the Lamb. A hundred million angels praise the Lamb. And lastly, not to be left out, the rest of creation joins in with the praise of the Lamb. Verse 13, Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them, saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Well, their message is the same, isn't it? And notice the extent of the praise. And notice who is giving it now. Every creature, we're told, in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and in the sea, every single living creature Every creature God has ever created will eventually, willingly or unwillingly, give praise where praise is due. It's a visual picture of Isaiah 45 and Philippians 2, where we read of every knee bowing in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledging that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Revelation 5 looks forward 
to the last day of the last days. A day when God's kingdom is finally fully established and all creatures are finally giving credit where credit is due. Well, let me wrap up. Our passage ends with verse 14. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. The scene closes with creation saying, Amen, which means, let that be so forever. That's what amen means. In other words, all creation is in agreement that Jesus Christ is worthy of our worship. I wonder whether you would say amen to that, to the conclusion that Jesus is worthy of worship and that anything less is inadequate at best and offensive at worst. Are you among those who have come to realize that Jesus has paid the ransom price for you to go to heaven? That price being his perfect life given up to set you free from death and judgment. Or maybe you still think that Jesus was nothing more than just a good teacher. This passage is challenging us to change our minds about Jesus, to say amen to the songs of praise that we read about here in this chapter. You see, the message of the Bible is not a wagging finger pointed at your sins, telling you that you'd better pull up your moral and spiritual socks. Rather, the message of the Bible is a finger pointing to a lamb on a throne, the crucified Christ, asking whether you have joined the chorus of heaven yet, asking whether you've yet bowed the knee to the Lion of Judah, who is the Lamb of God, who was slain for your sins. Today would be a very good day to do that. And as we did last week, I'm going to lead us in a prayer that you might like to pray in your own heart if you want to become part of the kingdom of God or if you want to rededicate your life to the king who is on the throne. If you'd like to become part of the priests who will serve this Christ and represent him and reign with him over the earth one day. So why don't you bow with me and pray with me. Dear God, I know that I am not worthy to be accepted by you. I don't deserve your gift of eternal life. I'm guilty of rebelling against you and ignoring you, and I need forgiveness. Thank you for sending your son to die for me so that I may be forgiven. Thank you that he rose from the dead to give me new life and to be worshipped by all creatures forever and ever. Please forgive me and change me that I may live with Jesus as my ruler from this day forward. Amen.